Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear Rick? Can you hear me? Yep. All right, Yay. good. Uh, my name is Kyle Cherick, and I'd like to welcome you to the Chef Demo Series here at Madison College, presented by Volrath. I host the television show on PBS called Wisconsin Foodie. PBS viewers. <laughs> I don't check for humility. I check because I vary my vocabulary based on whether you're PBS viewers or not. I can use bigger words nice. if it's PBS. See yeah. how you are? <laughs> Chef Rick Tremonto, when the history books, the annals of uh, culinary history for the West are written, he will get his own chapter. There is so much to talk about. No pressure there. Relative <laughs> to my friend's career that in trying to prepare my remarks, I hardly even knew where to start. I think the best place to start is that his first position was working under the esteemed culinarian Dave Thomas for Wendy's Burgers, the Spur Burger, uh, and that the only job that he's ever had has been that as a cook or a chef. Uh, but really to put it in terms of what he means to Western cuisine, and his cooking and his contributions and his skill are on that level, is what he brought us with Trio in 1994 changed the roadmap of American dining and Western cuisine. He and Charlie Trotter single-handedly, well, they have two hands, so I guess four-handedly, in addition to Gail Gand, brought the culinary world of America to a center in Chicago. Others would follow, certainly Rick Bayless plays in that, certainly Paul Kahn plays in that, certainly Paul Bertolotta plays in that, certainly Tony Montuano plays in that, and we can add names on and on and on. But it's fair to say that even if you had stopped at that point in your career, if not for Trio and what you had done, we wouldn't have a Megan Gauss, we wouldn't have a Grant Ackett's, we wouldn't have 20 other names that you're all familiar with and now that cover television shows and chef tables and so forth. It had to start somewhere, and the impetus for that was what Rick did at Trio. Topping that then was True, which um, if you can bring that standard even higher, well, maybe just a better kitchen. Bigger budget. <laughs> Bigger budget. All about the budget. Yeah, <laughs> uh, was True. Um, True uh, won a James Beard Award for Best Service. Rick had won a James Beard Award as well some years sooner. He is the author of nine books, the favorite of mine, uh, is actually his uh, memoir, St Scars of a Chef, which I think is probably the, um, and no offense, but the second best piece of food literature out there of honesty. Bourdain's, you know, I yeah. mean, it just is, yeah. But uh, he's gone and you're still here, so that's the good news. And oh. uh, yeah, I mean, not that he's gone, but um, that we can still plumb the depths of, of the person that you are and there's still more, still more stories to tell. It's such an honest book. It's, I think, required reading for anybody that's a student of the culinary arts, student of American culinary history, and that works in this industry and walks that path. If even it's for a few years in the service industry as I did through college or whether it's a career of 38 as Rick has that's still going. Um, by no means the end with True, uh, then, and, and I'm really abbreviating your career, but his next exceptional step was with Restaurant Revolution in New Orleans a um, partnership with John Falls. Uh, that, to me, um, is, I think, your finest accomplishment in the sense that it's so honest, such an exquisite fusion of American dining, and um, uh, humble and uh, elegant all at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Rick Tremonto. Uh, thank you. Now you can hear me. Now I there can, we now go. I can hear me. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk for a little bit, and then we're going to cook. And at the end of all this, we'll have questions. I, I just have a quick story. Actually, I have a question and a story. How many are chefs or in the profession? Could you raise your hand? Great. How many are students? Great. OK. So there's a snowstorm up there, right? Yeah. 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 So a week ago, roughly, 10 days ago, you know, everybody's going, you, you all live where I live, kind of in the Midwest, and then we have this crazy weather. Uh, you know, it's 6.30 in the morning, and I was re recently just back from Jackson, Mississippi, where I have a seafood revolution in Jackson. And it was about 6.30 in the morning, and I have a, um, I like to call it a small pony. At one time, about a year and a half ago, my wife said, 
man, you know, we had this incredible German shepherd for 15 years and about a 120 pound shepherd and Luke, Luke had died and we wanted to get another dog. We didn't want another shepherd. So it's like, let's get a new Finland. Yeah, what a great idea. Let's get a 170 pound dog. Yeah, that's a great idea. They don't shed at all. No. <laughs> Sweetest, most beautiful, we call her Miss B, like Aunt B, yeah? What photo is up there? Yeah. Is, the, is it the long photo of the dog? Okay. So when Miss B sits, her head is about here and her head is about this big. So if you can go to the next photo, is she in a snowstorm? Yeah. That was the morning of. So I thought it'd be a great idea. Take some pictures of my beautiful dog on an ice skating rink, basically, which was my backyard. And as she decided to get up and take a stroll, she just hit me the right way. And I literally, on this ice skating rink, went up and went down. And as she was looking over me going, are you gonna get up? Are you gonna get up? Are you gonna get up? I'm like, wow, I can't get up. <laughs> so my wife came and helped me get up and I tore all of my knee up. And, you know, in the chef's industry, at least in my world, you never call in sick, you have to call in dead. So I wasn't dead, so I thought, okay, I'm going to this event. So they wrapped me up and they threw a bunch of cortisone in and I'm gonna go have my surgery next week, but I'm here. So anything y'all gotta ask me. Life is short, right? So you better get it in. Go ahead. I just wanted to fill you all in on that. And then they're going to run just some colorful photos of my past, so right. we, can, we can look at those. You can go ahead and run There's those. a few bad haircuts in there, by the There's way. There's quite a few, actually. <laughs> Let's begin, because we're talking about Revolution and, and the restaurant that you have with John Falls. Let's talk about, uh, you've got a really great story that you shared with me that I want you to share with everyone of when you were setting up the restaurant. You weren't open. You were doing a meeting with the staff and suddenly everybody was focused somewhere else. Oh, yes. And you were still adjusting to New Orleans. Yes, so just to backtrack a little, you know, I spent a year in New Orleans studying New Orleans cuisine because for me, here I am, you know, in a pretty deep place in my career, and I've done many successful restaurants and steakhouses and osterias and Let Us Entertain You and True and Trio, and all of a sudden I kind of hit this wall at my seventh book thinking, I don't know if, what else I have to say. And you started to lose your voice, you started to lose some of your journey. And, you know, after 28 years or so at the time. Um, and six or seven books in, yeah. Yeah, um, what does a guy like me do? I'm not interested in television, I'm not a television guy, I'm a restaurant guy. Um, my dad went to prison when I was a kid, so I left school at 15. and started working in 1977, not to date myself, but you know, my mom was a very blue collar, hard working um, lunchroom lady during the day and a cleaning lady at night and I was an only child and we dug in and it was about a J-O-B. It wasn't about being a chef. So, you know, in that mindset, I can, you know, there's, there's a few things I can think of that I wanted to do, but one of them was I want to keep learning. I'm not going to go in to do music and paint and, you know, retire. I mean, I'm going to just keep cooking. What, I don't know what that meant at that time, but I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. Well, at that time, I was at my kitchen table watching the Today Show, watching Katrina unfold and not realizing how bad it really was until my wife's like, you need to call John who I had a very long relationship with through the industry and visiting New Orleans every year is like visiting Paris or London or Barcelona or Japan to continue my education and to continue my journey. And John had always been a huge influence and teacher. And I called John and for anybody that knows Chef John Foles, he's an incredible, iconic historian. And I said, uh, how you doing, man? He said, not, not well. And for John to say that, who's probably, other than my wife, the most positive person on the planet, I knew something was really wrong. And he said, it's really bad. And I said, well, what can I do to help? There's this long pause, because I need you to come down here. 
I said, what? He said, I need you to get on a plane, and I need you to come down here and help me. I said, okay, well, what are we going to do? He goes, we're going to set up the largest feeding station in St. Bernard's Parish, and we're going to feed all the rescue workers in the Red Cross and FEMA and plan on being here six weeks. I said, okay. You hadn't even finished breakfast yet. Well, I wasn't even finished breakfast yet. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> well, I packed, I got on a plane, I went down. He had a full entourage, as John does, of military. We went right down into St. Bernard's Parish. He had U.S. Foods and Starbucks and Kraft Foods and all these amazing companies set up these huge mobile kitchens. And we cooked, and we cooked, and we cooked. And we prayed, and we hugged people, and we loved on people. And we did that for a long time. When he dropped me off at the airport, six weeks later, he said, you know, life's never going to be the same. I'm just throwing that out there. I said, I understand. Now, I'm, I've never been in the military. I've, my dad was in the Korean War. I've never been in that kind of environment. But that's what it felt like to me. I got back to Chicago. And sure enough, John was right. Went back to my everyday life. And things were different. They certainly were different. And, you know, coming through 9-11 and coming through the worlds that were changing at that time in general, um, three years later, really, John called again and said, they're rebuilding the quarter. And there's nobody that I want to do this with more than you. Are you interested? And I was just finishing up my 10 years at True. I was going to take a little hiatus. And uh, I said, I'm in. But if I'm in, we got to begin at the beginning. And I don't know how you want to do that, but I'm going to come down and live in the swamps of Louisiana for a while and figure this out, and you're going to have to teach me. So for a whole year, I lived in John's beautiful Civil War home, and we did a history lesson for one year. And John has written 12 books, and four of them are encyclopedias about Cajun and Creole cuisine and the seven nations of Louisiana. If anybody, you know, people think, you know, oh, New Orleans cuisine, you know, Cajun cuisine, K, you know, K-Paul, you know, spice. And well, it's so much deeper than that. It's yeah. about the historical piece to the seven nations. And I'm going to get to your question in a minute. It's OK, buddy. The seven nations of Louisiana. I'm just taking the we long. We get together I'm, every two years, I'm and just it's taking, like this. I'm just know. taking the long road, because he does this every day. I'm giving him a break. So we went into the swamps, and we learned about the swamp floor pantry, and we understood the ingredients of the seven nations of the American Indians, and the Germans, and the French, and the Spanish, and all the people that occupied mm -hmm. this Louisiana at one time. Speeding up, we're building this restaurant, which took a year. As I was learning for a year, they were building the restaurant for a year. So day three, we're in pre-shift, and I have you know 100 people. And there's windows, because we're in the French Quarter. We're on Bourbon Street in Bienville. That's like being in Times Square in New Orleans, in the Royal Senesta. So there's all these windows behind me, and I have all this staff, and I'm going through the food and talking about the food. And all of a sudden, every eye in the room lifts, and they're <laughs> like this. I thought, hmm. And as I turn around, it's the naked bicycle race. <laughs> There's about 250 people naked on bicycles, from young to old, from pretty to not so pretty. And they said, welcome to Louisiana, chef. There's your answer. <laughs> He's a hard guy to stump. He's got nothing on me. So what was it like? Uh, uh, in the moments after, you know, you 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 set you you had trio and then you had uh, you had your brasserie and true, true mm -hmm. yep. But you moved on to true, and it was that moment where all my dreams can literally come true. I mean, you and Gail had been traveling Europe. You were partnered with Richard Melman, the seminal, generous, wonderful, greatest maybe without a doubt American yeah. restaurant tour. Uh, without a doubt. Yeah, I mean. Um, you know, you can count them on, on there's, there's basically Joe Baum and Richard Melman, but, but Joe Baum could have gone to school on Richard Melman's first 10 years. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you get to have everything you want, but, but sometimes that's not a good thing for creative juices. 
You know what I mean? Like, how did you still keep the fire based on what you did at Trio when you were plating on tiles that you bought at Builders Square and you only had X amount of budget for ingredients, so you had to, like, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. And you only had so many ladles and so many this and that kind of thing. Yeah, so for, for those of you that maybe aren't so familiar with the story, we did a little restaurant, it was a 60-seat restaurant in Evanston called Trio. And the trio was myself, Gail Gann, who's a very famous pastry chef, was my wife at the time, um, and partner and a uh, gentleman named Henry Adanya. That was the trio. Who still has great hot dogs in Honolulu, by the yeah. way, and Maui. Go to Henry's Oat Dogs. That's right. They're amazing. That's right. And Henry, the first day we opened, he said, you know, I just want you all to know that when this all fine dining stuff's done, I'm going to Hawaii to open up a hot dog stand. And we were like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and he was serious. Sure enough, he did, right? And I was three in. Um, so, you know, we, um, we had no money. I mean, it was $150,000 of, you know, Henry's grandmother's money and some build-out dollars from a landlord. We had nothing, nothing. But we still were a four-star Rally Chateau, you know, um, restaurant with nothing. It was all about the center of the plate. It was all about the food. We had six and a half million dollars when we did True. We had a million dollars just in art. <laughs> we had a hundred thousand dollar China budget. <laughs> so it was very playful and different. Um, but it was blue sky, so we were really able to do things that pushed us out of our box. Um, because if somebody says to you, think as big as you can think and you still can't think big enough, that's, that's awesome. That's an amazing place to be. And that's what Rich gave us. Rich gave us a platform with zero um, hedge around it. And he just said, I don't care what you do, you just need to be the best. That's it, whatever that means. And it was an extraordinary experience, but it came down to one thing. It came down to the team. It came down to handpicking the staff and the team. You know, the New York Yankees or the New England Patriots I know that's taboo maybe here, like here in Chicago. But, you know, those, you know, the, the Chicago Bulls, like those hand-picked teams that have gone on to win championship after championship, you know, let's face it, it you know, there may be one star or two star players, but it's a team. It's a team sport. Restaurants are a team sport. So front of house, service, wine program, you know, getting the Spectator Award, getting best service by James Beard, winning another Beard Award, you know, all of this stuff was fueling the fire, I'm back to your question, fueling the fire of what kept you going. Because all of a sudden, there's validity in it, there's realness in it, there's people saying, wow, this is extraordinary, how do you take it to the next level? Well, you know, Danielle or John George or Charlie Trotter or whoever it may be, they keep throwing these, these things at you. So you keep going back to study those, 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 those chefs and saying, okay, where is the bar? And Grant has done a beautiful job of that. And, you know, there's so many young chefs that have been able to wrap their arms around that. For us, it was about, yes, everybody's doing multi-course tastings. So let's do four of them. Yes, everybody's doing four multi-course tastings. Well, let's give everybody a different dish for every course. Now, I know that it maybe, you know, I'm going a little over a little bit, but if you can just think about it, we're doing 150 covers a night. We're doing 10 to 12 courses per person. We're doing 1,000 plates out of my kitchen, my little kitchen, every night. We're 8 to 12 weeks in advance for four years. Over and over and over and over and over, and the machine is churning. Now it's like, okay, well, if you're a six top and you're going to have a soup course and a foie course and a fish course, let's give you a foie course, let's give you a different one, let's give you a different one, let's give you a different one. Now we've cranked it up to 300 dishes a night. So you have to understand the intensity and the, the craziness mm -hmm. of that um, time. But that's how we kept it going. We kept telling ourselves, what's next, what's next, what's next? And as long as the team was supporting and keeping up, and we were very blessed to have this iconic team. We were talking earlier, you know, we have 10 or 12 kids that have multiple restaurants and multiple television shows and multiple books, and they're so well established that came through that restaurant and that school during that time. It's like a proud dad, and they all went to Harvard, and they all made it. Like, it's awesome. So that was the, that was the fuel, you know, and keeping the substance at a distance and keeping the 
you know, I call it the access and the excess at, at a distance. Um, and I was lucky because I was married to my partner. So for me, you know, I worked with my wife every day. I slept with my wife every day. I went home with my wife every day. And Gail will be here in a couple of months, so you can hopefully come and see her because she's a blast to listen to. And, you know, we, we ended up not being married but being best friends and having this incredible child and these multiple restaurants and books together that, you know, I was very blessed to be able to come out of that alive. So that's part of the fuel, it was that. It's a good answer. No, thank you. <laughs> so let's flip the script a little bit. And you're back in Rochester, New York, where you grew up. Um, challenging childhood, just to say. Just, it, it was. Uh, Which we all, I mean, yeah. we all have who, who, right. crazy stories. Right, yeah. right. I'm just saying it wasn't ideal for uh, one of Americans America's premier culinarians to come out of. Uh, well, yes and no. Right. I mean, you know, I like to challenge that because I wasn't, I wasn't confined to a box, and I keep using that phrase. And believe me, what a beautiful example of excellence behind us and on the side of us here. Um, kudos to you guys. I mean, just awesome, dude. Unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable facility, unbelievable staff. You know. I would have given anything to come and do this at this point in you know my life, and you know I'm still working on that GED. I don't have that quite yet, but once I get it, I'm coming, and I, I'm going to have an honorary scholarship to come here um, when I can find two years of my life to carve out. But but the, the the point is is that you know it I did have a lot of kids and folks come through the kitchen that had professors and culinary teachers in their head that said, well, no, you do it like this, and no, you put it like this, and no, you turn it like this, and this is how it needs to go, and da 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 Well, I didn't have that. There was no voice in my head but my own demons sometimes, but you know, at the end of the day, it really gave me the opportunity to create anything I wanted with no rules, and that turned out to be my biggest advantage. Gail, which she'll tell the story, I mean, she went to the Cleveland Art Institute and she had a four-year art, art degree in metalsmith and diamond setting and painting. Then she went to La Varenne and did four years of culinary and pastry in Paris. So she had the mix of both. So I was able to then soundboard her many, many times of, of color palettes and flavor profiles and things like that that would make sense and then put it on, put it on the center of the plate as I'm learning and layering flavors and all of my travel and teachings of my world was coming together. But look, I didn't learn how to, re I want you to really hear this loud and clear because I know that there may be some folks and kids in this room that may be in this journey or coming through this journey. So listen carefully. I didn't learn how to read until I was 28. And Gail taught me how to read. Just think about that for a second. Here I am going to New York City in 1981, going to the Tavern on the Green to work for Patrick Clark, or going to the Gotham Bar and Grill to uh, apprentice with Alfred Portali. And they're like, we're making consomme tomorrow. Go home and read LaRousse and tear it up and come in and I'll show you how to make consomme. Well, A, I don't have a, a Scoffier or a LaRousse. Mm -hmm. B, even if I did go to the library, I probably couldn't make out many of the words because I was all hands on. Because my 10th grade education didn't allow that to go much further than that. 11th grade education didn't allow that much further than that. So Gail has, has, has uh, um, saved, uh, and my wife, who I met at Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers, by the way, who've been married for 15 years to her, um, have saved things that I have written that would just, and I should have brought some, would just blow you away. Like it was like doctor's writing times crazy person. <laughs> like what? And when you learn how to read to a point where you can actually read a book, and mine happened, the first book that I ever read was the Bible. So at that point, you start to then go, oh, this is what he meant by making a raft and by doing this and by doing this and da 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 da. And everything kind of really came together. But everything for me was painting by numbers. 
tasting. Get out of my kitchen. Go do this. Go do that. I mean, the moral of this story for you guys in the back, I knocked on a lot of doors that the chefs didn't have to let me in, and a lot of them didn't back in the day. But you still have to knock on the door, right? So when you're done with this journey and you go out into the workforce and you want to stage or apprentice or have any type of further education by a, by a chef who you admire, because I want to go learn Italian, so I want to go knock on an Italian chef's door, or I want to learn Spanish, you still have to go knock on the door and kind of muster that courage to go, I know nothing, teach me. <laughs> Let me in, please, right? So that's my whole life, is knocking on a door and some letting me, some letting me in and some telling me go away. Dismiss. That's okay, here I am. Oh. Nice. Talk about that first chef in Rochester that really gave you a chance, Greg. Greg Broman. Yeah. Yep. Greg yeah. Broman, um, Strath Allen Hotel. I was coming out of, did the Wendy's thing for 77, 78, went to Scotch and Sirloin, 79, I went to, uh, which was a steakhouse, and then went to a real kitchen, which was called the Strath Allen. Um, Greg was the sous chef for um, Andre Saltner at Latesse for many, many years in New York, and came back to Rochester and settled in and was running the, the finest French hotel in Rochester. and. Um, knocked on the back door and, you know, back in the day they could smoke in the kitchens, right? You know, literally like smoke in the kitchen and put it on the edge of the, of the, of the, <laughs> of the piano and keep cooking. Um, and as they would do the brandy, you know, do a few of those. <laughs> so that's just how it was, right? And, uh, and Greg said, okay, you want to learn how to cook? Great. Be here tomorrow at six. Okay, great. And Greg broke it down because I was not in a place to have that much pride to tell Greg, hey, by the way, chef, you know, I can't read real well. Ah, it's okay. Well, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> like, I, you know, this Espanol recipe, what is, I'm not really sure what that's saying. Yeah, let me show you. So Greg was the first one that actually stopped in his tracks, put the book on the shelf, cleared away all the stuff, put the cutting board down, and said, here, let me show you. And I did that for three years with him. Mm -hmm. When I got to this place where he said, okay, you need to get out. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I mean, you need to get out. You need to now go find another chef and continue the journey because I've shown you what I could show you. And oh, yeah, by the way, it's not in Rochester, New York. You need to move to the, to the nearest major metropolitan city, which is Manhattan. So pack your stuff. Say goodbye to your mom and go to Manhattan, and it's 1982, 1983. Big shoulder pads, everyone. <laughs> Big shoulder pads. Hair. Big hair. Right? Mohawk, six <laughs> earrings, six floor walk up in the West Village, sublet, one bedroom, living with two other girls, not bad. <laughs> um, just kidding. So yeah, so it was, um, it was amazing. And uh, eight years in New York, and met Gail, and she was from Chicago, and it was time to move to a little bit more of a digestible city. Um, and I was struggling with substance at that time, heavy substance, and went to a re couple rehabs, rounds of rehab, and was again you know, pulled out of that environment and taken and started up again in Chicago. Um, and that's where I met Rich Melman, and that really changed my my whole course of, of my life because I didn't have culinary and college background, so food cost and labor cost. So I, I always articulate it like this. In my Scars book, you know, going to Wendy's, I mean, let's face it, it was like, you know, Rochester and even New York for that matter was kind of like culinary high school. Going to Chicago and working for Lettuce Entertain you was like culinary college learning about the business, opening restaurants, being part of a big corporate team, um, really being taught again from scratch how to do things, whether it was learning how to do Excel or learning how to calculate food cost, 
It was all done right there. There was no classroom setting. There was none of that. But I knew that grad school was missing. Well, what was grad school? Europe. Because I wanted to go work for the chefs who I worked for worked for. Well, mm. how am I going to do that? I ain't got no money. I got no education, really. So I went to Rich and said, I really need to get to Europe. And he said, let me make some phone calls and see what I can do. Found an extraordinary man named Bob Payton who had a country house hotel in Leicestershire, England, who used to be owned by Lord and Lady Gretton, who owned the Bass Beer Corporation, and they brought me and Gail over to Stapleford Park. And Bob opened up many, many doors, from the Rue Brothers to Raymond Blanc to Alain Chappelle to Michel Girard, and the list goes on and on. And um, four years of that, and then coming back and uh, planting back into Chicago. Grad school was done. I, w I had a voice and I was ready to speak my voice. Worked with Lettuce for a few more years and did some openings, little openings like Mangiano's and the Corner Bakery and you know, wildfires and you know, big, Rich was doing huge restaurants. And I'm like, come on, let's do this little, tiny, fine dining, fussy thing. And he's like, no, 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 well, you know, we're, doing, we're doing this. I'm, I'm becoming a billionaire in food right now. And I'm I'll like, get back to you. I'm like, yeah. in 180 <laughs> restaurants strong. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna leave. <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, you call me when you're ready. I said, okay. So I went and did this little restaurant called Trio. Yeah. And then exploded. And I'll never forget the day Rich did walk in three days after our four-star review, and he said, should have did this with you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> and then, you know, many years later, when we had the opportunity, we did a restaurant called Brasserie Tea, and... Gail got her show on the Food Network with Sweet Dreams, and we were writing books, and you know, your life seemed beautiful, but it was melting. Our marriage was melting, everything was melting. You know, drugs were trying to come back into my life. It was really a very high pressure world. And Rich came back in, and we had a fire at Brasserie Tea. We lost our restaurant, burned it to the ground. And uh, he said, okay, you ready to go downtown and do all this? And I said, okay, because we want to go head to head with Charlie Trotter. I'm going to give you an open budget. That's when he said, I'll just never forget the day. It doesn't matter how much this is going to cost. It matters is can you and Gail come into this environment and produce? Can you be the best? Because it's all, it's all kind of bullshit if you can't. So that's, where, where, that's how that started. So 10 years at True. Again, you know, we did Osteria Via Stato, we did Tremonto Steakhouse, we did multiple, multiple things. And that lead us, led us right back into this New Orleans story that I was kind of bringing you. But the education piece, Chef Paul's, you know, an incredible and his team is incredible. You have an incredible facility. Um, don't be disappointed when you leave here and you're like, Where's all the great equipment? <laughs> Where's the Volrath bowls? Where's all the nice whisks that have these fancy colored handles on them? Right? So you should embrace, and you should go, I'm driving the Ferrari, man. Because now I may have to go drive it like a Honda. So I'm just saying, you know? So there's two quick, quick, Anecdotes that I want to tell about your path. Tick tock, we got to cook. I know, I know, we got to cook. But there's, you and I both believe that, like, we're not in charge. There's something greater, right? Yeah. And there's a moment in your life where you get to Chicago and you go and do a tasting for uh, at, at, at Le Francais, which was at the time in America the best French restaurant. And the chef said, I can't hire you because you have a blonde mohawk, six earrings, and tattoos, and you don't look like you belong in my kitchen. Yeah. And if he had hired you, yeah. you may never have done Trio. Oh, no doubt. And then you would have never done True. And we might not know each other, which would be really sad, the real tragedy. Yeah, right. And then we wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So thank you, Jean Bonchet. Yeah, for, for, not, <laughs> for not hiring. But you told the story before that some years later he brought another. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I have two quick stories. I have three quick stories. So we have we'll, get, we'll get to the so. Julia Child one while we're cooking. <laughs> so. So uh, 
yeah, so, so year four, you know, I think we had just cycled through, we had just, I know what it was, we had just gotten, I, I was the youngest chef ever inducted into Rally Chateau, Rally Gourmand, and it was in St. Petersburg, Russia. And I get to go to St. Petersburg, <laughs> Russia. This is still and trio. I get to, this is true. True, okay. And we're about year four into true. And we've, again, we've established four stars through the, the Trib in the Sun and the Chicago Magazine and the Restaurant of the Year by John Mariani, blah, 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 blah. All, all the stuff, I like to say, all the stuff. Food and wine, James all, Beard, all, all that the stuff. stuff. Yeah. So after all the stuff, it was like, okay, this is really cool. Now we're getting in. Now we're getting to go, do cool stuff. So my maitre d comes and says, "Hey, Jean Bonchet just called, and he's with Paul Bocuse, and he wants to come in your kitchen and say hello and have dinner, and it's during like the restaurant show, and of course there's no tables, and it's like." <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out, you know, get them a table, build a table. Right. There's, there's, some, wood, Kuss, there's some wood in the back, <laughs> there's some legs in the dumpster, go build a table. Why are you talking to me? <laughs> and the kitchen, and I had maybe, you know, 25 people in my kitchen usually at all times. So it was very busy, a lot of stuff going on. And sure enough, man, Rich comes through. And we had these sliding doors. You ever see Star Trek? That's right. So like Star Trek, like entering like the Star Trek Enterprise, and it's like, psh, psh. So we had these glass doors, right? And psh, and there comes Rich. Psh, there comes Jean Bonchet. Psh, there's Bocuse. It's like, oh my God. It's like Bocuse, right? It's like there he is. Comes right, and there's like, there's shit flying everywhere. We're in the <laughs> middle of service. There's so much stuff going on. And we're rolling foie gras torchons on the table. And Bocuse just comes over, doesn't say a word, looks, Looks. We had copper. It was like this. Not quite this nice, but almost. <laughs> we had copper everywhere. It was very, very sexy. And he looks at me and he says, well done. I was done. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? Well done. Did you hear that? <laughs> that that's the story. That's, it. that's the story. Yeah. All right, let's, let's, let's cook. Go. And there'll be more stories while we're cooking. <laughs> Get my dog. <laughs> so we're doing a moose. What are you doing? Ending with lamb. I thought you were, that's what you were doing. No, no. Oh, that's what I'm doing. Oh no, no. Right. It, this is how how poorly this is going. Is that I'm the pretty face? Yeah. Well, <laughs> can you all see? Yes. All right. So we thought we would take some things very quickly because it's a school night. And we would, we would take something from each book. So I'm going to do the best I can to walk around back here and thump around. And you're going to help me and be my hands and don't go anywhere. Um, and we're going to tell stories and try to make it make some kind of sense. So in 2002? Two? Yeah. It moves. My, oh, yeah. My history major. Yeah. 2002, uh, probably now 2000, so two years before. Um, no. 89, um, right, right before, because True opened in 2000, so 1989, I got the opportunity to go to Paris with Gail to do some R&D, and we land uh, um, very quickly in the middle of the afternoon, and we jump in a cab, and we have reservations at Germain, Robichon's restaurant, three-star Michelin in Paris, and we're rushing to go to Germain, and um, we rush in, and we're late, and you know, we're American, so it's two strikes against me already. And we sit down, and the maitre d' comes over and um, says, you know, lunch is almost over. You know, we're, you're having the tasting menu. And we're like, yes, we're having the tasting menu. And like, OK, we sit down. Within five minutes, these plates started to come to the table, kind of like this, these little plates. Two of them came. And I look at Gail, and two more came, and then two more came, and I'm like, did you order this? <laughs> right. She's like, I didn't order this. I'm like, I didn't order this. I asked the waiter to come over, and like, um, excuse me, but we didn't order any of this. Oh, no, this is the amuse-bouche. This is the gift from the kitchen. First time ever that I experienced that. Six years to the day, I wrote a 100,000 selling amuse-bouche book, which I'm very proud of. Um, 
So I thought we would take one from each book to try to make it make some kind of cohesive sense. So um, everybody, we all good? We all, you all understand? So it, it means a lot to me that, that, that this book is not only taught in culinary schools, but it came about so humbly and gracefully and innocently um, that was really changed the trajectory of everything. Because we were writing at the time the true book and we had so much material for the true book that we could have wrote two books and Random House gave us a three book deal. So we tore it all apart and we ended up doing an amused book, a true book and something called Fantastico, which is the Italian version of that. Yeah, so we took some beautiful salmon belly uh, from Orca salmon, uh, which is a beautiful, um, uh, very clean, high fatty salmon. We just took the belly of that and we diced it up and th the boys were so kind and the team was so kind was to do all of my mise en place because I gimped in here today um, <laughs> and struggled on, on how I was gonna do this. So, um, so just bear with me a little bit. So some, some salmon, we have some, some fresh lemon zest, um, some shallot that I'm putting in here. Um, beautiful um, Italian extra virgin olive oil. Had to throw the Italian in there. Yeah. Just hope you caught all that. A uh, little bit of green onion. Forget that Israeli or Spanish That's olive right. oil. That's right. Some fresh ginger you put in there. A uh, little bit of uh, mirin. And then just a touch of soy. What is mirin if someone doesn't know? Yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a sweet wine mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that has great sugar content. And I'm gonna have you hand me that bowl all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. This plate? The bowl. bowl. That's a plate, that's a bowl. <laughs> Thank you. You cook, huh? Yeah. Not on television, yeah. I've been very so, careful about that. And I'm gonna that. take the blue, the blue paper, yeah, the yeah. blue paper, <laughs> the blue paper, no, the blue, no, you had it right the first time. I did. The blue paper the closest and the blue bowl. <laughs> yes, sir, see? Love this guy. The name of Thank my... You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be here all next week, I promise. The name of my wife and I's production company is actually a moose bouche. I didn't realize how connected to Rick I was. Yes. <laughs> um, the salt and pepper? Yeah, 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 Remember, yeah. Remember, I have one leg. I'm just, just clearing that up. I'm, I'm, I'm handicapped over here we for chef. a second. Yes, thank you. So we're gonna put a little black, and what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> We're gonna put a little salt and pepper here. Very simple amuse boost. So again, amuse. The word amuse. To entertain. To mm -hmm. amuse. Bouche. Mouth. Amuse the mouth. Amuse the palate. Amuse the tongue. Explosion. So usually they're one bite because you have one shot and one bite. We wanted to turn this into a little bit more because I really wanted you to see some of the fun, playful, inexpensive, thinking out of the box, presentation. A lot of times you go to restaurants, they're served on little spoons, they're served all different kinds of ways. I used to love, because we had no money at Trio, using origami paper, construction paper, anything untraditional that either was a non-traditional piece of china, like granite or marble, or we would go to Home Depot and we'd look at uh, a medicine cabinet. One time we had no money. We went to Home Depot, went to the bathroom department. There was a medicine cabinet that had glass shelves. We pulled out the glass shelves and said, wow, this would make a great plate. You know, strips of mirror that people would use for their bathroom decorations. Whatever it was, I just know it was under five bucks. That's what I do know. It wasn't a $120 piece of Versace like it became later on. So I love color and I love being able to be playful. So I just asked today as I came in, I said, hey man, do you guys have any origami paper or any construction paper? Because I don't want to just use a traditional um, you know, piece of paper. So they came up with this just little blue construction plate paper. And these are fun things for you guys to do if you're at home and you're having some fun and you're trying to impress your guests. So when the, when the uh, Chicago Tribune restaurant critic, Phil Vitale, who's a friend of both of ours, now, uh, Rick didn't know him at the time, wasn't supposed to, came into Trio and reviewed it, and that was an extremely tenuous 
moment, of course, and the paper came out at, what, 3 a.m., and I think uh, Henry went and got a copy. He did. His line was, I've seen the future of American dining, and it resides at Trio, at Everest, and at Charlie Trotter's. One was serving things on tiles that they bought at Builders Square, and the other was high above the financial headquarters of Chicago with an incredible view. And the third was, well, he had his own, but he had quite a budget at that time, too. Yeah. But to be mentioned in that breath, per se, you know, was uh, incredible. So we have this beautiful, lush, fatty salmon. We have this great, you know, salt component of, of, of the soy. Um, and then I want some more fat, and I really want some cream. So I took some Greek yogurt and a little bit of cilantro and cracked black pepper and a little lime. And I'm just going to hit this on here because that will mesh beautifully with that. And then I took these great little wonton skins, and I've done it with pasta chips. I've done it with, you know, tortilla chips. But just this great little crunch that it needs. And it's really just a great little amuse. And that's just that simple. It's like two bites. It's all the sensations of, of, a, of, a, of an amuse-bouche um, to have some fun with and make it playful. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm into playfulness. I mean, there has to be technique. There has to be flavor profile. There has to be all these things. But at the end of the day, do I want to eat it? Is it delicious? And is it fun? Can I have fun with it? Can you all go home and have fun? That's what I want you to do. Go home and have fun, right? So that's one. Okay, let's keep going. Is everybody with me here? Yeah. Y'all go and, home. And for those of you, how many of you have been to the demos previously? Okay, great. So you know at some point, delicious bites of what the chef has talked about and made will come out once. Today, you're going to get three. Yeah, <laughs> just saying. You, know, you know what's interesting? You win. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You know, the interesting piece to all this was, I was like, you know, I was the first one to sign up. I was all about it. Oh, well, no, 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 let me stop you. So <laughs> Madison College reached out to me, and I'm humbled by this, and said, we've been doing this demo for a few yes, years, this demo series for a few years. We'd like to bring it to another level. Will you help us? And I said, I'd be delighted to. You've got a great facility, I believe, in everything the college is doing. Some friends are uh, very successful graduates of it, and it's a form of, of helping within the culinary community. Uh, and they said, who do you have in mind? And I ticked off a bunch of names. And they said, Rick Tremonto, do you think you could actually get him? And I said, well, I do. And when he says yes, I'm going to build the rest of the demo series around him. So I called Rick first. He said, it's, not about, it's just about timing. When can we do this? Next spring. I called you in the fall. I called you in the summer. In the summer. In the last summer, August. last August. And you weren't basically available until now. I said, that's no problem. But once Rick said yes, then I could call, just look at the rest of the series, everybody else, and say, I'm doing the series. This is how it goes. Tremonto's in, and they fell over themselves to say, I'm in too. So that's a credit to your legacy, Chef. Thank you. Yeah. And then my dog knocked me over. Who'd have thought, <laughs> Who'd have thought that was going to happen a year later? <laughs> OK, so now we're going to bridge to Steak with Friends. Steak with, Steak with Friends to me was I have three boys um, at the time, all under the age of 18, so 14, 16, and 17. I'm working all the time. My, my, uh, my wife, Eileen, who I met at Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers, she was the sandwich girl. I was the burger guy. We were <laughs> friends our whole lives. Um, never were boyfriend and girlfriend. We were just, you know, part of this great friendship that we had. And many, many years later, we had, you know, she had gotten married and moved to Ann Arbor, and I got married and moved to Chicago and had this career. And my mom had, my both of my parents had died, but my mom died first, and we kind of reconnected at my mom's funeral. Um, and it was like one of those, you know, duh, you should have married your best friend, but, you know, I, uh, this long journey. So Eileen became this, in, you know, great, incredible cook at home. And she would prepare all the meals because I was never home and I never cooked at home because I just cooked, you know, 
16 hours a day every day. So we wanted to do a home book, and I was five books in, and my publisher said, you should do something at home, and I'm like, I don't really cook at home. They're like, no, 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 you should really do something from home. And I said, okay, great. So we did an Osteria book, um, which is the Osteria book, which is cheese courses out of. But the meat section in the Steak with Friends book was exciting. And one of the things I used to love to do when I was at home is I, I'm a brazer. I'm old school mm -hmm. braise, you know, short ribs, lamb shanks, asabuco, anything that I can braise, I'm all about it, right? Um, so for me, it was very important for me to, 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 to do this. So one of the things I loved all the time at home was doing these shanks. But what I would love to do is I would, um, I would shred them because, you know, to get a 15-year-old to eat a braised lamb shank, you know, was, was a little sh challenging. So I used, to, I used to make them and make these stews, but I started making tacos out of them. And I started making, like, pita breads out of them. And I started shredding them out and doing all this really fun stuff with them. And they were loving it. They were loving life. So um, I'm just going to show you a quick little technique. This is really bugging me here. Sorry about that. And I, and I have to say, not as a plug, because Rick is here, but we've got, I don't know how many cookbooks we have. We have a lot of cookbooks. We're very blessed with that. Uh, they get sent to us for free. That's super cool. Sometimes they're already signed by friends. It's, it's great. We have about four that we hit up pretty often. One is Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And if you drop it, it folds open to one of three sections, either crepes, omelets, or a roast chicken. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of the others is your Steak and Friends. Nice. Yeah, which I use Good. all the time. Uh, and it works. It works. It works. Nice. It works. Like it it's, works. I'm a family cook. We, you know, it works. Another one is uh, Tony and Kathy Montuano's uh, yeah, Bar Food. Great book. God, I love, love that book. Love it, love it. Yeah, yeah. And people will come over and like, how did you get these olives to be like, it's right here. It's right. five things and it takes about a night. You just let it marinate. It's yeah. pretty easy. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, anyway. So you can go to your butcher, and I think you guys have Mariano's here? Whole Foods here? Yeah. yeah. All the above? Wegmans? Yeah. No, Wegmans here, right? No. So um, you can get them tied, which if you want to fuss and muss, you can. And it's a great skill set to learn. Um, and you can, no, it is. It's no, fun. I'm just laughing because no, no. I tried once and it looked like Texas Chainsaw No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so but, bad. But you know what? So did mine, the first 10. <laughs> but but, but it's, it, it's practice makes perfect, right? I mean, let's face it. Any skill set you do, you do it over and over and over, and repetition is, is the king. Um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. But for me, I don't do this at home. I may do this in the restaurant, but I don't, I don't tie at home. Um, all these deeper techniques, I don't have an immersion circulator at home, or I don't have an anti-girdle at home, and I don't have a sous vide machine at home, even though everybody thinks I do, but I don't. I, I cook like my mom. You talk to your Volrath friends, though. Maybe you could. Well, Volrath <laughs> friends. Let me give you that address. <laughs> no, I'm good. So great, heavily seasoned on, on all sides. I also think it's funny that I have more stuff than he does at home, apparently. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, I have three restaurants with kitchens, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, salt, pepper. I got, some, um, I got some canola oil in the pan. Um, I love these lodges and these La Crusades. And, yeah. Um, that's all I cook with at home because everything has to be stews and braises and you know great things like that. I'm a big, um, I'm a big chicken guy. Like I can cook chicken. Like I, I did Iron Chef, but my Iron Chef ingredient was fennel, right? And I lost by one point, but but that's okay. That's okay. It was about the experience. No, it wasn't. It was about winning. Who did you lose to, Rick? I lost to Mario Batali. I know. <laughs> oh. By one point. That's okay. We did an extra course, and <laughs> we tried to show it up, and, you know, it's home field advantage. You know, it, it, uh, that's okay. So I have these all over, and I love them. And if you're doing these, this also goes great with braised fennel. That's why I brought the fennel thing in. Um, so heavily seasoned. We're going to sear hard, hard, hard on both sides, get it super caramely. And obviously, I'm, I'm, we're pushing, and because of the magic of television, we're going to show you many, many things quickly. Um, who, who braises at home? Does everybody pretty much braise at home? Do you all have La Crusades and, and like beautiful little Dutch ovens and stuff? Yeah. 
Do you love it? I mean, is it, the, is it one of the, the best things, right? It's great. So as this is going and caramelizing, we're going to keep going. I'm going to help you with this. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank and you. we're going to make a farro risotto to go with this. As you would a risotto, um, we would do a, yeah, if you would be so kind. Traditional risottos, uh, arborio rice. I do, I do, some shallots, some garlic, I melt or sweat. Um, I'll toast the rice. In this case, we're gonna, we're gonna toast the farro, which is the ancient grain. We're going to uh, have some cremini mushrooms, some onions, uh, some thyme, some black truffle. Black truffle's optional. People always say, how much black truffle? And I always say, how much can you afford? As much <laughs> as you can afford, right? So that's kind of the gig on that. So we're just gonna start this just a little bit with a little bit of olive oil. And we're gonna sweat the garlic. And some onion. And you use yellow in this case, not red. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and this is going to start to sweat and start to caramelize down a little bit. And I don't want a lot of color. I really just want it to be translucent. And then I'm going to take this beautiful farro and we're going to toast it. And like I said, we're kind of skipping through a lot of the pieces as far as the sweat, but you understand. And as this is starting to sweat and starting to cook, it will start to add the stock and the wine and reduce it all down. And what I'm trying to show you is, just like our traditional risotto, you're gonna get a traditional risotto of farro. So as this is done, it's got a great light delicacy to it. We're it's gonna really finish good. this with a little Reggiano Parmigiano cheese and a little bit of butter and a little bit of the truffle. So that's what this is right here. Tell me about the time that you cooked uh, buffalo for Julia Child. Yeah, right? Because I know that was on the menu at True. It was. So, and don't really? try this at home because my hands are different than yours. Um, but just to get all this going before we go into that. So as these are pretty caramelized out, some onion, some celery, some carrot, and then all the aromatics are gonna go in. Some thyme, some rosemary. You can see how accurately I'm measuring everything, <laughs> precise. And why is that? Because maybe this is my 500th time I've done it, but I think at the end of the day, if you make a recipe three times and it comes out, it's yours and you can do whatever you want. Like, I always start with the base recipe. I learn how to cook it. I'll cook it once. Ah, I cook it again. Ah, I cook it the third time. The fourth time, the game, game on. Like, I can do whatever I want hmm. because now it's my recipe. Now I can twist it. I can turn it. I can change it. And to me, that's the magic of cooking, um, especially if you're non- traditionally trained, I had to be careful on how I said that, non-traditionally trained in this environment. Because um, my, cooking, my cooking is just what you see. You know, I'm, I'm cooking, I'm tasting, I'm understanding, I'm, I'm looking, um, and that's how, we're, that's how we're gonna roll. So now that the mirepoix, the aromatics, and the, the shank is all in there, If you can drink it, you can cook with it, right? Now we can talk about Julia Child. That's my lead-in to Julia Child. So, me and Gail had the opportunity to do Baking with Julia. It was one of her last series that she did. And Julia had already come to Brasserie Tea and Trio and True um, just because people brought her there, so she was already fans. And I'm not gonna do my Julia Child voice, but when Gail's here, Gail will do the Julia Child voice and she'll uh, do it impeccably. I'll impeccably. ask her to do it. So she can do that. Um, <laughs> Julia used to call me Deary. I think she had a crush on me. Okay. She did, she used to call me Deary. Hey Deary. Will you come to Cambridge, Massachusetts and come cook at my house? No, right? Oh. Who's gonna say no to that, right? So sure enough, me and Gail get on a plane, we go to Cambridge, Massachusetts, car picks us up, go to Julia's house, 
This is these big trucks outside, all these big cables coming in. It's like full studio, full production. Crazy. It's amazing. We go in, her assistant meets us at the door, chicken stock, seeing if you're paying attention. Red wine, chicken stock, beef stock or lamb stock, whatever you're using. Give it some body. You got time to lean, you got time to clean, brother. <laughs> There's nobody to love that more than all the students. <laughs> chef, we oui, chef. I need, <laughs> I need a little pan for my risotto. <laughs> so, okay, none of you can get away with that. Except <laughs> We're gonna cover this. It's gonna go in the oven. 350 degrees until it's done. How do you know when it's done? You got that? Yeah. This is how I know it's done. Because I said it's done. Two and a half hours, three and a half hours. Low and slow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Back to my story. It's hard to do this on one leg and then, right? So Julia's assistant meets us at the bottom of the stairs and says, Julia's upstairs. She's on the phone with the White House, so she'll be just a minute. <laughs> Go up the stairs and there's all these pictures with queens and kings and politicians and like, you know, it's like going to the Mecca. So we come in and she's got her back towards us. I'll be with you in a minute, dearie. Okay, Julia. So she finishes her call. She spins around. Oh, it's so great to see you. Uh, love, kiss. Uh. Go downstairs into the basement. That's where we're filming and prepping. Do your stuff. I'll meet you in my kitchen. Great. Go downstairs, do all the stuff. We go. We film, we film the gig. We, we do our part. Now, Julia's kitchen's in the Smithsonian, right? And like you, you know, you're like, wow, I've been in this kitchen, only not in the Smithsonian. Yeah. Right? And we'll get to the end of the shoot. We were the last day of the series. So she was, she was in a wrap, they call it, right? Big fancy TV thing. It's right. a wrap. It's a wrap day. Rick, would you mind cooking the wrap dinner? Yeah, okay. What do you got? Well, somebody sent me a buffalo hump. It's in the back fridge. <laughs> like, Gail, did she just say buffalo hump? <laughs> I'm like, great. My big chance cooking it. I'm sorry, but I have to picture this. You have to really picture this. I'm like, I'm at Julia Child's house, and I got <laughs> fucking buffalo hump. <laughs> really? Like, that's my secret ingredient? <laughs> like, yeah, it's in the back. Okay. Go in the back and open up the fridge. There it is. Big old buffalo. <laughs> it's like a steamship round. I'm thinking, I'm going to treat this like a steamship round. Okay. Pull it out. Stud it. Garlic. Rosemary. Make it all sexy. Rub it all down. Sear it. Throw it in the oven. She's like, okay, I'm going to have the driver take you back to the hotel. You freshen up. Come back couple hours. It's like, okay, buffalo humps in there. Turn the time around. Just take it out like this. Just take it out. Let it rest. Yeah, we got it. We got it. Okay, great. Come back. <laughs> it's about 35 people. <laughs> Sorry, I know how this ends. <laughs> Big, beautiful table. <laughs> it's a gorgeous table. So on the risotto. I'm going to make you all wait now. So we're going to finish the risotto. I'm just going to put a little chicken stock in here so we can then reconstitute this, this uh, farro. So walk in, this beautiful table is all set up. Gail's like, there's a turkey in the center of the table. <laughs> like, no. Like, the buffalo hump didn't come out. Julia, where's the buffalo hump? 
oh, it's in the back, dearie, it's resting. Well, why is there a turkey on the table? Oh, you know, I thought maybe people wouldn't like buffalo hump. You know, I'm not sure. I thought I'd make a turkey. Smart, right? I mean, just like, I made a turkey just in case. You know, just got a little sucker, just doing a little thing. I'm like, okay, I go back, pull the foil <laughs> off the buffalo hump. It's like, beautiful. I mean, it's like top chef shit. It's beautiful. Slice it, lay it out, bring it. The end of the meal, we're outside. End of the meal, she's going around and she's thanking everybody. I would like to thank my producer, Jeffrey Drummond. I want to thank my cameraman, blah, blah, blah. And I want to especially thank Chef Rick Tremonto for the best hump I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd your mind go? Back to the risotto. <laughs> so we're going to put the risotto back in here. I gave Julia Child the best hump she ever had. Like <laughs> okay, enough playing around. Are you with me? You sure? Yes, sir. Okay. So, farro, mushroom, reggiano parmigiano, black truffle, all good. So when I brought the shank out before we went to commercial break, I strained it, mm -hmm. and we made this beautiful reduction. I just took the liquor and I literally just strained it into a pan and just really reduced it down by about half. And I'm just gonna finish it with just a little bit of butter because I really want a sheen to it and I really want it to have this really great um, richness, this viscosity, as I call it, or this mouthfeel that I'm looking for, which would be fantastic. And as this risotto is starting to, the farro is starting to come down. We're gonna put a little butter in here. I'm not crazy. Is there butter over there? Yeah. yeah. It's Wisconsin after all. Yeah. yeah. Come on. You wanna do me a favor? Would you grab that whisk behind me? Because the eyes behind my head say that there's a whisk. No, you gotta come over here. You gotta work a little, brother. Gotta work a little bit? Yeah, you gotta work. Gotta yeah, don't burn your hand. All right? right? Yes, you with me, brother? I am. So just whisk. Yeah. You don't even have to touch it. Just whisk. No, go slower. slower. Make, and feel it. You feel it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even yell at you once today. Um, what else you got? What else you want to talk about? I, I got all kinds of stuff. So the menu at um, Revolution. And then you opened up Revolution Seafood. But we, that's, it's basically, this is a fusion menu of John False. Right, so we've, took, we've taken this old iconic Seven Nation um, history food from turtle soup to gumbos to jambalaya to um, death by gumbo, all, all kinds of wonderful things that are iconic. And I brought in this Rick Tremonto flavor, um, and we kind of fused old school and new school together and we kind of reinvented. And it was very dangerous because for any of you that understand tradition, whether it's Louisiana tradition or German tradition or Spanish tradition, it's tradition. You don't mess with it. End of story. So, Well, how many of you have been to New Orleans? All right. How many of you have been to Commander's Palace? All right. Nice. Nice, yeah. I mean, that's, I just use that as an example, or maybe K. Paul. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. There, there's, there's places that you go in New Orleans where, well, two jogs. They've been serving the same menu for 95 years. So there's flavor expectations that run so deep in that city that there's no metaphor or comparable for any other city in America. And there's so many restaurants that are one on top of each other in a very small space. And Rick and John opened up in the center of that where people are most likely to go for those flavor memories. Um, so Thank you. when he's saying it was very risky, uh, like I can't even really give you a comparable to how 
risky that would be because you're, it's like someone changing something in your grandmother's cooking, only that's a national piece of flavor memory. So, go ahead, my friend. Yeah, so, you know, taking a lot of that stuff and trying to reinvent that wheel was, was very dangerous, but I felt always protected because I had John. And to know John and to understand John's history and depth and his extraordinary knowledge is, is unquestionably unparab- unparalleled to anybody that knows about Cajun and Creole Louisiana history and food. So it was like, it was like the ultimate tightrope, and you got to trust the other person on that tightrope. Mm. And if you look away from them, you're going to fall. So as long as you can lock eyes and as long as you can walk the tightrope, you're going to be okay. That's how I felt. Restaurant of the year, blah, 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 blah. So we did it. We achieved what we wanted to. We're eight years in. Um, Open up a second. In. Open up a second one, seafood. Yep. And now, I don't know. What, now, what do you want to do now? Any ideas? <laughs> Go join the circus? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Um, I can say that Rick had us uh, as guests. We, we, made, we were in New Orleans two years ago. Um, so we're going to play. Yeah, we're going to play. we're ready. All right, we're going to play. So my faro risotto is very beautiful and smells yummy and <laughs> is full of mushroom and cheese and truffle. And we're listening to you, Kyle. Don't think we're not listening to you. My wife is having a child in the next four weeks, and it was on that trip that we decided we should go for that. Not literally, but it would be great to have a child. Can you see me? And it was after the meal, actually, at Revolution. And, uh, you know, I reached out to Rick and said, we're going to come in. We're going we're gonna to try as much of your menu as we can handle, afford, and handle. And he said, no problem. Totally get it. Delighted you're coming in. We walked in, and one of the guys who ran the bar was from Milwaukee. Nice. Uh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Used to be at Bacchus with Paul and Joe. Huh. Then we get our table, and the maitre d' comes by, and he was from True, the French guy. Right, Serge. And he, yeah, Serge. And he knew Justin, who graduated from this program. So by the time we're on our fourth course that Rick picked out for us, uh, it was like old home week. And we were having flavors that we've never had before in our lives. The best pairings I've ever experienced, period. Uh, and it started with the caviar staircase. And it ended at about midnight. And I had never been. It's one of those meals where you finish and you think, I'd like to press a button and do it all over again. And I'm so happy. That's the power of great food. Oh. That's beautiful, it's my shame. friend. Yeah. So, braised shank, far risotto, Reggiano, black truffle, little braised mirepoix. Um, little red wine sauce, followed this, you know, before that, this beautiful little fatty, yummy salmon belly, amuse-bouche, amuse-book, steak book, osteria book. Now, when you were married or when I was married, well, I'll say we, but when I was married um, <laughs> to Gail, being married to a world-class pastry chef <laughs> for and being partners with a world-class pastry chef, as a chef, you don't want to do pastry so much. And I say that in, in, in the most respectful way because I know pastry really well. But every time I attempt to do anything from a pifiteral to chocolate mousse, it's just not as good. So I kind of opt out a lot of times. That's why I had ended up partnering with a pastry chef for many, many years. And it's pretty amazing because what that allowed me to do was to learn it and be proficient at it and humble at it, but to also become what we call a chef pastry chef, which you start to gravitate towards chocolate sundaes. <laughs> or <laughs> let's do a cheese course. <laughs> because you know whatever pastry you do is not going to be a Gail Gann pastry. It's just not because she dedicated her whole life to a single subject cuisine, pastry. 
and you know, it, uh, it's a beautiful thing that that, that that is what it is. So I chose today my second favorite thing in the whole world, um, which is a cheese course because of where we are. And we were going to do a triple, tri uh, triple cheese, brilliant Severin um, mm -hmm. piece of cheese that is my favorite of all time cheeses. And we have a cheese cart. We had a cheese cart at Trio. We had, I don't know, 10 or 12 cheeses. We kicked it up a notch when we went to True, and we had 20, 22. And now in New Orleans, we have about 25. So, you know, the cheese cart starts to get out of control, and you start to segregate. But at the end of the day, you truly do fo focus on, for those that love cheese, a single cheese. And my favorite single cheese has always been any kind of Brilliant Severin, Brie style, triple cream with citrus and salad and bread. And that to me is what I wanted to show you today because it is one of those things at home, which I think is pretty amazing that you can do super easy on the fly. And the whole key is just making sure that the cheese is the right temperature. Mm -hmm. If you can temper a piece of cheese and you can find a great piece of cheese, and it doesn't matter if, let me say this right, it doesn't matter if anybody else likes it in my, in my heart. If you love this piece of cheese, like we did this little tasting this morning, and there was this beautiful French piece of cheese and this, this, uh, this, triple, this triple cream out of Wisconsin, and it was a blind tasting. And we all picked this, right? But in the French cheese was super, super strong. It was really pungent. It was kind of overpowering everything. But there was a place for that in my mind for something. It just wasn't this. And you know, you go back and forth. But I, I think that there's something to be said about a great blue and a great Roquefort and a great goat and whatever that may be. You need to find that. And you need to eat it with some great bread and some great salad and some great accompaniments. And whether you're cooking something or you're going to brulee some great piece of citrus like blood orange or car car orange or whatever it is, make it yours. That's all I'm trying to say is, is find your flavor profile, find your flavor palette and share it with others because anything I did here is not right or wrong. It's just mine. Nobody taught me, you know, in a closed setting how to do it. They taught me the technique. They showed me the, the way. But at the end of the day, you start to go, yeah, well, I don't really like celery, so I'm not really <laughs> going to put celery in there. Or I don't really like garlic. My wife's not a big garlic person. I'm a huge garlic person, so there's conflict. <laughs> so, you know, so, but, but I, I mean, I say that really, really humbly and truthfully, but I think you really need to, to know that and be, be comfortable with that and be, be good with that. So this has been sitting... And we're going to really just, this is a cheese course, not an appetizer. So, you know, we're going to really just do, okay, maybe not. So we're going to do a piece. And we're going to have some fun with it because I'm all about fun, right? We're going to take the bottom rind off, but I like the rind. And everybody's like, oh, you're not supposed to do the rind, da, da, da. Well, you know what? It's okay. I, I, I'm digging the rind. So I'm going to do it like this. And then I'm going to do it like this because I want to, because it's my cheese course. If it was your cheese course, you'd do whatever you want. I'm even going to use the sticker, because I used to do that all the time, because that's how I would do it. And then I want some pepper, which I'm going to use arugula. And I want some parsley, because I want some earth. And then I want some bitter, so I'm going to use some frise. And then I want some killer sherry cherry vinegar, because I want some high acid. And I want some beautiful Spanish olive oil. And then I just want to toss. Thank goodness this is a Volrath bowl. Thank goodness. Because I know how you like it. Because it feels them. like yeah. a Volrath bowl. And it's got the rounded edges, and it feels yeah. wonderful. We were geeking out about Volrath bowls before. And he's got kind of a, I think fetish is too strong of a word, but fascination with the right bowls. I do. I'm a, I'm a big bowl geek, <laughs> and uh, I'm the first to admit that I'm a bowl geek. Now, I don't like garlic on my croutons, on my crostini, 
when I'm doing cheese, because to me it's all about that. And the other thing it's all about for me, it's all about the citrus. And we're doing this coarse sugar, which is not, not it's thicker than regular sh sugar. Um, and when you're doing like creme brulees, it just sticks to it much, much better. But it also gives this beautiful burnt sugar, like a, like a creme brulee. Um, and the car cars are so sweet because that's, what, that's what's in season right now. And I would normally do blood orange or I could do Meyer lemon, but these are just, I don't know, they're just perfect. It's just, it's hard to beat what we're doing. So I just have this blowtorch that I would fix my plumbing with. And I'm really <laughs> just gonna torch this and I really do want some beautiful caramelization yeah. and, and even some burnt vibe to it. Beautiful. So you're bringing some of K. Paul's blackened. Uh, yeah, to well, this. I'm kidding. Yeah, that wouldn't be the way to go. <laughs> so I could go here. Oh, you go here. Ah, I'm gonna go here. Right. It, it, I'm just trying to make a point. I mean, I jest, but guys, at the end of the day, it's your food. Do whatever you want. That's me. Do we have someone with a microphone to take questions from any or all of you? Uh, I had a question. Now. What's more fun for you, cooking in a professional environment or for friends and family? Uh, you know, it's a professional environment because that's where I'm most comfortable. Like, you know, any any service that's going on is such a um, it's it's an adrenaline junk for me. So it's like jumping out of an airplane, jumping into the middle of service in any capacity and having the ability to work yourself in to any service where you're not feeling in the way just give me a palette knife and a towel and I'll just plate and I'll just I can just it's just a it's a whole different thing because you have to remember I grew up an only child did not really spend a lot of time around the family table until much 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 later in life so you know Cooking and eating with my family is about being with my family, but enjoyment of what I do is cooking in chaos. All right, thank, you. thank you. Another question nearby, right? There's another, yes, right over there, sir. I'm, you're very accomplished in your career these days, so I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to share. I understand that, but. Yeah, I'm an open book. I, you know, all, my, all my skeletons are right there, brother. What sure. do you got? Well, all the grades and in any career or any sport, there's a lot of failure. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share. All the share some failures? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Chapters 3, 6, yeah. 9, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, 1 through 10. <laughs> failures. Um, failure to learn how to speak French. Yeah, if, if I could have done it all over again, man, if I could have just learned how to speak French, it would have been a world changer for me. Because again, here, here I am coming into not only an environment where I can't read well, let alone read well in another language, let alone speak in another language. So, you know, being, being, having the opportunity to go stage at the places that I had the opportunity to go stage with, in lieu of about three of the chefs, Michel Girard, Alain Chappelle, and um, Pierre Gagnier, those three chefs, for whatever reason, to this day, I could not tell you whatever reason they liked me. Didn't matter to me. But they liked me enough to not kick me out of their kitchen. They liked me enough to spend the time to show me, even though they didn't really speak a lick of English and I didn't speak much French. But because of how I was introduced to them, because my door that opened those doors was Michelle Rue and was Raymond Blanc, and those two British chefs, while we were living in England, opened up the French doors for these two Americans that had no business being in those kitchens anyways. But for whatever reason, you know, if I could have just communicated better, I'd be, I'd be a better chef today. I mean, I'm an okay chef, but I mean, 
You're warm I've, I've up. Done, I've done a lot of good stuff. I've done a lot of good work. I'm really proud of my work. But just like your kids, just like for me, my kids are they're better people than I ever was as a kid. They're better educated. They're better, kinder, you know, less messed up than I ever was. Yeah? The kids that came out of my kitchen, oh, I messed them up for sure. But, but, but they're better. And I guess if that's the goal, then I have achieved that. But personally, when I look back, ah, I could have done so much more if I just had a little bit more education or a little bit more skill set. Just think of what I could have done. Shit. Right? I mean, I did a lot. I'm proud of what I did, but I can't even imagine what I would have accomplished if I was like, you know, really off the hook on it, you know? And that's where there's the prodigies, Jose Andreas and Grant Ackes and, you know, the, you know there's, there's a handful of people. Here's how I describe it. This is the best way I describe it. There's a lot of pilots, airplane pilots, that can fly commercial and private. A few of those, they can fly like military jets. A few of those can be, you know, blue angels even. But like a minute can be astronauts. And those guys are, those guys are astronauts. You know, the Ho Jose Andreas and the Grand Actus of the world, they're astronauts. Uh, you know, at best, I'm a blue angel. At best. That makes sense? Yeah, that made perfect sense yeah. to me. Yeah. Just made that up. I, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, Chef, I may have to say, I'm a bit enamored with and like humbled by your lack of ego and just how authentic and real you are. I just want to say thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Especially with people in the room. Yeah. If you could go back and impart like a gift of wisdom to your younger self in this industry, which can be really tough, yeah. what would you say to yourself? Pray more. Like my, you know, it, it, to me, it is my spiritual journey at this point. It's, it's, you know, I would have, I would have uh, disconnected from substance a lot earlier, and I would have uh, realized that, you know, it's, it's not me, it's him, and and I would have, I would have, um, I would have practiced, and I practiced is such a, not a really the right word. I would have grown closer to God quicker and sooner, um, and the times that it wasn't about me. Or the times that it was, um, self-medicating because it wasn't about me, that I wasted a lot of time. So I, I would say to my younger self, "Stop wasting time. You're doing okay. You know, maybe get some more education earlier on. But when you go back and I play the real, and I do play the real over and over and over and over." Um, Ah, uh, there wasn't a window. Like I, I still can't find the window of where that would have been. I'm still looking for the window. I'm still looking for that scholarship to come to school here <laughs> after I get the GED when I have a little time, you know. So yeah, I think that yeah, there's a lot of that piece of stay away from the garbage, stay away from the excess and the excess, and stay focused on your path and be kind. I wish I was kinder. In the heat of it, the ten years of the journey. It was like a box. Not that I was, not that I was mean spirited, but I certainly had very little patience and very little sleep for ten years, and you know certainly could have been kinder to many people. But I think that the circle back would would have been, uh, if you ask the Graham Elliott Bowles and the Justin Carlyles and the you know whatever you can make the laundry list yourself. But the ten or twelve that have become great chefs and television personalities and ask them. Another question. Yeah, another question. <laughs> I'm a home cook. Yay. Five things other than nice balls and a good Dutch oven. <laughs> and something they have in their, in their home kitchen. Five things that you need to have in a home other than a Dutch oven and a... And nice bowls. And nice bowls. Um, I can't live without my microplane. I love my microplane. I love my Vita Prep. Um, 
you know, I'm, again, I, I wish I could tell you that I have a lot of R&D time at home because all the toys that I need, I have three kitchens like this that, you know, I walk in and that's my playground. When I'm, when I'm home, I'm getting pushed around by my big dog and <laughs> hanging out with my kids and my wife. And <laughs> well, you're decompressing. But, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I think a VitaPrep is, is, is amazing piece of equipment. Um, and again, a great set of knives. I, don't, I think if I, you know, they always do the, what's the one thing you can't live without? My knife. I mean, I can do anything. I can do anything that any of those other pieces of equipment can do if I have my knife, my great knife. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know. I, I think there's, and it, I think it goes back to what are you cooking? You know, I mean, my my wife loves to cook stir fry, so we got her this beautiful wok for Christmas. You know, I don't, wouldn't necessarily. I don't do a lot of wok cooking at home. You know, and um, I think a great sheet tray with a great sill pat. To be able to do you know those kinds of things. Volrath makes one. I love. Yeah, Volrath makes one. Seriously. So yes, yeah. um, it's so like blowtorch. Gotta have a blowtorch, right? So yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on what you're doing and what it is that. But if you're cooking for five kids every day and you're making, even if you're making homemade mac and cheese, great set of pans, great set of mm -hmm. Volrath pans. But but at the end of the day, you know, really, the stuff that you use every day, whisks and bowls and pots and pans and brazers and. Things that are just every day, a great nonstick pan. You know, I make omelets every day, almost, right? So a great nonstick pan. And I know Volrath makes a great they nonstick do. pan. New no, Coos because I do great, have that. I yeah. do have that at home. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird in home cooking. Like, we have a pretty great kitchen. We're fortunate that way. But the truth is, probably could get rid of 80% of it. Yeah. And I wouldn't miss it. Yeah. And, and if I'm really, like if I put a little sticker dot on the things that I use across the course of a week, at the end of the week, I know there'd be, you know, like seven dots yeah. on like eight or 10 things. Yeah. And the rest, we'd be fine. The Go thing away. I can't live without is China. <clears throat> I'm a China junkie. <laughs> I, and I swear, I swear to you, I have a China room at home. <laughs> I do. And I have, a, I have a pretty big basement. And in the corner, probably as big as that control room over there, just shelled out. Because I shoot a lot of my, my home books are all shot at home, so I do a lot of photography work and food styling at home. But I probably have, you know, I don't know, 100 show pieces at home that are not sets. I mean, there may be one or four or five or platters or whatever, but when I'm cooking at home, I'm like downstairs rummaging through all my stuff because it, I do want it to be beautiful, and I do want to do the spread. The chefs did this beautiful dinner for us before we came out here and you know everything was just you know laid out and stunning and on these beautiful family style platters and these big bowls of sliced bread that's the that's the cool part you know is people walk in and it's like wow was Martha Stewart here right it's like like you know what I mean like you, you, it's that, no Paul Shorts it here. goes that's right <laughs> um, it goes it goes hand in hand I think and and for me if I had to Yes, those, those, those cooking things are key and important and luxury, but I think any kind of entertain, regular entertaining for family, you know, invest in some cool china or go to you know, some cool thrift shops and get some awesome platters and bowls, and like that's the fun for me. Some construction paper, whatever, you know. Cheese label. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know. Another question? And I'm curious, as you got into um, ownership um, early on in your career, did you find it advantageous to start small? Like yeah, this? that's a great question, man. It's a really great question. Um, no business degree over here. So it's real easy to sell your soul and get burned. So whether you're going to own whether you're gonna partner. Um, partnerships are like marriage. So you better make sure whoever you're going to partnership with, you'd be married to. You better know all the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and you need to get burned, unfortunately, a few times to understand that. But there's nothing greater than a great business partner, just like there's nothing greater than a, a great wife to complement the things you don't have, I'm all creative. I'm all disciplined. I'm all about that. 
and I've been fortunate to have partners like a Rich Melman and a Gail Gann and a John Foles and people like that that really had my financial back. So at the end of 10 years, when you look over and you're ready to like take a break, there's something. And I just know too many guys in my life and too many things in my heart that those guys are gonna look over their shoulder in another few years and there's not gonna be anything for them or very little. And it's hard because you've, you've, you've spent your journey in your life you know, with that. So everybody wants to own and everybody wants to be a partner, but remember there's liability. You know, there's risk and reward. You know, after two or three times of my journey, I wasn't interested in pushing all my chips in the center of the table and getting a second mortgage and putting all the liability on the line. I sold my talent. At the end of the day, I do licensing deals now. I'm a no-risk chef. Um, I have no baggage that I haven't already written about. Um, I have a skill set. I'm a culinary mercenary in a lot of ways. So if you need me to go into a consulting environment or, a, or an environment, I can turn your kitchen around in a blink. I can build teams. I can run teams. I can create. I can develop. I can do all of that. But, you know, I'm 55. I just put three kids through, you know, incredible schools. Um, as I was saying, I'm really proud of my kids that have this incredible education from London School of Economics and Harvard and you know, Western and all these places. And I'm not, it's not necessary for me to risk anymore. And yes, when you're younger, I think you risk more and you, you're a little cockier and you're, but I think you should just take a, take a step back and take a breath and go, well, why am I partnering? And do I need to partner? Um, and look, everybody's gonna have a different story. I mean, there are chefs that are say, you know, Rick, you're out of your mind. I would only partner because they want the control. And I guess it depends on what the journey is. I mean, I was a partner at True and I had culinary control, not financial control. I gave that to Rich. Who else would I want to give that to? I didn't have 100% um, culinary control at Revolution because we're a licensing deal with the Senesta and I'm partners with John Foles. I did a project with the Weston Starwood for five years and 2008 happened. I didn't see 2008 coming. I lost four restaurants in a day, a day. I got a phone call at three o'clock in the afternoon saying our mother company, our, our, our development company that we were partners with went bankrupt. We're putting the chains on the door at three o'clock, go tell 300 of your staff they're out. Really? Well, I'm never gonna do that again. So scars of a chef means scars of a chef. Go get some scars and you'll figure it out. But, but at the end of the day, I think that there's, there's this balance of the why, the what, the who, the when, the how, the project. There's so much variable to it. Um, but I'm not, I, I, I'm not necessarily, I don't need to be a partner. I need to be able to have some control and some final say, and I need to make some money. But I never got in it for the money. I mean, I needed a job, so <laughs> it, it turned out. I did all right. Let's do uh, one more question. Um, I was kind of curious what kind of advice you give to young and lean cooks, culinarians, hospitalitarians, yeah. to TV or Madison College who are graduating this year. Yeah, great question. So. Buy the sweatshirt. So, wear it with so pride. I'm gonna I'm gonna end this I'm gonna end this question with a slideshow because I was waiting for this question and I did, I should have planted you. <laughs> so my my ultimate advice: whatever it takes, however you do it, however many doors you have to knock on, to anybody and everybody's kitchen. Because someday, and I, I think you should be the one to do this, I probably have 300 photos of my journey. And for some reason, I always took photos of some kind because I wanted a record of any chef and every chef that I had 
respect for or wanted to learn something for in the world, I have a photo of with me or somewhere with them. And whether it's Alain Chappelle or Anthony Bourdain or Emeril Lagasse or blah, 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 I got hundreds of them. My advice is to do two things. Record your journey the best that you can. Just photograph your journey because over a 30 year period, it's going to go like that. And you're going to have all these great memories of Pablo Coos and you're in Pablo Coos's kitchen and I have a mohawk with a mustache and six earrings <laughs> and I couldn't even pretend to convince anybody that I looked like that. Alfred Portali, my mentor, my first mentor at the Gotham Bar and Grill. Bobby Flay, we're like 12, right? What are we, we're both like 12, right? So, I mean, I grew up in this industry as like a 12 year old. I mean, I'm joking, but I'm not. Like every event and every chef that I ever wanted to touch, ask questions to, pick their brain, go work at their restaurant, whatever. Record your journey, write it, shoot it, whatever you do. And knock on as many doors as possible. I don't care if it's for a day or an hour or if it's in Tokyo or if it's in Barcelona, doesn't matter. Go spend as much time in as many kitchens as you possibly can just to see what kind of bowls they use. <laughs> right? Why not? That's it. Those are my two pieces of advice. <laughs>